If you ask an infantry soldier on the ground what the most beautiful sound in the world is, they won't tell you it's a symphony or a birdsong. They will tell you it is a terrifying, guttural roar that sounds like the sky itself is being ripped apart. B -r 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 that is the sound of the GAU-8 Avenger, a hydraulic Gatling gun the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, spinning at 3,900 rounds per minute. And the machine built around this gun is the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II, affectionately known by those who love it and feared by those who hate it as the Warthog. In the sleek, sexy world of fighter jets, where speed and stealth are kings, the A-10 is an anomaly. It is slow. It is ugly. It has no afterburners. Its engines are mounted strangely high on the tail. But the Warthog wasn't built to look good on a parade ground, it was built for one specific, brutal purpose, to kill Soviet tanks in a European apocalypse. During the Cold War, NATO planners were terrified of the massive armored divisions of the Warsaw Pact rolling through the Fulda Gap in Germany. They needed a flying tank opener. The Air Force didn't want a fast jet, they wanted a sledgehammer. The design philosophy of the A-10 is unique in aviation history. Usually, engineers design an airplane and then figure out where to put the guns. With the Warthog, they built the gun first and then designed an airplane to carry it. The GAU-8 Avenger is so massive that if you removed it, the plane would tip backward on its tail. It fires 30mm depleted uranium shells. These aren't just bullets, they are milk bottle-sized kinetic penetrators that travel at three times the speed of sound. When they hit a tank, they don't just explode, they liquefy the armor, turning the inside of the vehicle into a superheated spray of molten metal. The recoil force of the gun is so powerful, 10,000 pounds of thrust, that it actually slows the plane down when fired. But offensive power was only half the equation. The A-10 had to survive in the most hostile environment imaginable, low-altitude flight over a battlefield swarming with anti-aircraft fire. The designers at Fairchild Republic created a flying tank. The pilot sits inside a 1,200-pound titanium bathtub, a shell of armor capable of stopping direct hits from 23mm explosive rounds. The canopy is bulletproof. The flight controls are triple redundant, if the hydraulic systems are shot away, the pilot can still fly the plane using a system of manual cables and pulleys, like a World War I biplane. Even the engines were placed with survival in mind. Mounted high on the rear fuselage, their heat signature is masked by the tail wings, making them harder for heat-seeking missiles to lock onto. And if a missile does hit? The engines are spaced far apart so that if one explodes, it doesn't take the other one with it. The A-10 can fly with one engine, half a tail, and huge chunks of its wing missing. It is a machine designed to be beaten, battered, and shot at, yet still bring its pilot home. When the A-10 was first introduced in the late 1970s, the fighter mafia in the US Air Force hated it. They wanted fast, high-tech jets like the F-15 and F-16. They looked down on the Warthog as a relic, a slow, primitive beast that had no place in modern warfare. They tried to cancel the program multiple times. They argued that in a modern war, the A-10 would be sitting ducks for enemy SAMs. They were wrong. They didn't understand that war is not always about clean kills at 30,000 feet. Sometimes, war is about mud, grit, and close air support. And in 1991, when Saddam Hussein's forces invaded Kuwait, the ugly duckling of the Air Force would finally get its chance to scream. The desert was waiting, and the warthog was hungry. January 1991 Operation Desert Storm began, and the skeptics at the Pentagon held their breath. They had argued for years that the A-10 was too slow to survive in a modern war environment filled with radar-guided SAMs and anti-aircraft artillery. They predicted heavy losses. But as the coalition forces launched the air campaign, the A-10 didn't just survive, it dominated. The vast, flat expanse of the Iraqi desert wasn't a trap for the Warthog, it was a shooting gallery. And the targets were the thousands of Soviet-made T-72 and T-62 tanks of Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard. The pilots developed a terrifyingly effective tactic. While high-flying F-16s and F-15s dropped laser-guided bombs from safe altitudes, the A-10s got down in the dirt. They prowled the battlefield at altitudes so low they could see the faces of the enemy soldiers. They hunted in kill boxes, grid sections of the desert designated for free-fire destruction. 
When they spotted a tank column, the carnage was systematic. First, they would launch AGM-65 Maverick missiles to take out the mobile anti-aircraft units at the front and rear of the convoy, trapping the vehicles in the middle. Then, the feast began. This was the moment the GAU-8 Avenger truly sang its song of death. For the Iraqi soldiers on the ground, the experience was psychological torture. Because the 30mm rounds travel faster than the speed of sound, the soldiers would see the sand exploding around them, tearing men and metal apart, before they heard the gun. The silent death would strike, and only seconds later would the terrifying BRRRRRRRT roll over them like thunder. It was the sound of the sky ripping open. Iraqi prisoners of war later confessed that the A-10 was the aircraft they feared the most. They called it the Whispering Death, because by the time you heard it, you were already dead. But the war wasn't without its dangers. The A-10s were flying directly into the teeth of the enemy's defenses. They took hits. Lots of them. This was where the genius of the Fairchild Republic engineers proved itself. Stories began to circulate back to base, stories that sounded like tall tales until the mechanics saw the planes land. One A-10 returned to base with a hole in its wing large enough for a man to crawl through, caused by a direct hit from a surface-to-air missile. Another landed with one engine completely blown off, the cowling shredded, and the hydraulic system severed. In any other jet fighter, an F-16 or an F-18, these pilots would have been forced to eject over enemy territory, facing capture or death. But the warthog refused to die. The pilots engaged the manual reversion system, wrestling the heavy controls with pure muscle power, flying the crippled beasts home on a wing and a prayer. The titanium bathtub did its job, deflecting shrapnel that would have turned the cockpit into a coffin. The warthog wore its battle scars like badges of honor. The climax of the A-10's performance came in the final days of the war, on a stretch of road leading from Kuwait City to the Iraqi border. Highway 80 as the Iraqi army realized the war was lost, they attempted a massive retreat. Thousands of vehicles, tanks, armored personnel carriers, stolen civilian cars, and trucks clogged the six-lane highway. It was a traffic jam of retreating steel. And the A-10s were called in to clear it. Four hours, flights of warthogs cycled through, raining depleted uranium and cluster bombs onto the stalled convoy. It wasn't a battle, it was an annihilation. The devastation was so complete, so absolute, that the media dubbed it the highway of death. Mile after mile of burning wreckage stretched across the desert. Twisted metal, shattered tank turrets, and the charred remains of an army that had once claimed to be the fourth largest in the world. The A-10s had fired so many 30mm rounds that the ground crews struggled to reload them fast enough. By the time the ceasefire was declared, the obsolete A-10 Warthog was responsible for destroying more than 900 tanks, 2,000 military vehicles, and 1,200 artillery pieces. It had accounted for more confirmed kills than any other aircraft in the coalition. The ugly duckling had become the undisputed angel of death. The pilots who flew them and the ground troops who watched them work knew one thing for certain, the Air Force could try to replace it, they could try to retire it, but nothing else in the sky could do what the hog did. But as the smoke cleared over Iraq, a new battle was brewing, not against an enemy army but against the bureaucrats in Washington who still wanted the warthog dead. You would think that after decimating the Iraqi armor in Desert Storm, the A-10's future was secure. You would be wrong. Inside the air-conditioned offices of the Pentagon, a new war was beginning, not against a foreign enemy, but against the warthog itself. The high-ranking generals of the U.S. Air Force, obsessed with speed, stealth, and high-tech wizardry, still viewed the A-10 as an embarrassment. It was slow, it was ugly, and it was low-tech. They wanted to funnel budget billions into the new, shiny toy, the F-35 Lightning II. The argument was simple, the F-35 is a stealth fighter that can do everything. It can dogfight, it can bomb, and it can provide close air support without ever being seen. They argued that in a future war against China or Russia, the slow-moving A-10 would be swatted out of the sky in minutes. They called for the immediate retirement of the entire A-10 fleet. But they forgot one crucial variable, the soldiers on the ground. When news of the retirement broke, an uproar exploded from the infantry ranks. Army Marines, Special Forces, and ground troops flooded Congress with letters and testimonies. 
Their message was clear, an F-35 flying at 20,000 feet dropping a smart bomb is clinical and detached. But when you are pinned down in a mud hut in Afghanistan, with bullets snapping past your head, you don't want clinical. You want the warthog. You want a plane that flies low enough to scare the enemy into submission. You want the psychological impact of that gun. However, the legend of the A-10 is not without its bloodstains. Being a blunt instrument in a complex war has a dark side. The A-10 was originally designed with very primitive avionics. For decades, pilots often relied on nothing more than a pair of binoculars and a map on their lap to identify targets. This lack of technology led to tragic blue-on-blue -blue incidents, friendly fire. The most infamous occurred during the 2003 invasion of Iraq, when a tens mistakenly strafed a British armored column, killing one soldier and injuring others. In Afghanistan, similar tragedies haunted the fleet. Critics pointed to these events as proof that the cowboy style of the A-10 was too dangerous for modern, chaotic battlefields. The warthog was a sledgehammer in a world that increasingly required a scalpel. Recognizing this, the Air Force, forced by Congress to keep the plane, finally agreed to modernize it. The A-10C was born. They gave the old warhorse a digital brain to match its brawn. New glass cockpits, advanced targeting pods, and laser-guided weaponry turned the brute into a precision sniper. The friendly fire incidents dropped dramatically. The Warthog had learned new tricks. Today, the A-10 Thunderbolt II has achieved a status that no other military machine enjoys, it is a pop culture icon. The sound of its GAU-8 gun, BRRRRRRT, has become the most famous sound in aviation history. It is a meme, a ringtone, and a symbol of overwhelming power. Internet forums and YouTube channels are filled with tributes to the titanium bathtub. It represents a philosophy that is dying in the modern world, simple, rugged, and unkillable. As we look to the future, the days of the A-10 are numbered. The airframes are getting old. The wings are cracking from decades of pulling high G-turns. The era of stealth drones and hypersonic missiles is dawning. Eventually, the last warthog will make its final landing at the Boneyard in Arizona, where it will sit under the desert sun, gathering dust alongside the B-17s and P-51s of the past. But until that day comes, the enemies of the United States have to live with a terrifying reality. Somewhere out there, prowling the clouds, is a flying gun with a painted shark mouth. It doesn't care about stealth. It doesn't care about aerodynamics. It only cares about one thing, protecting the soldiers on the ground. And for those men and women looking up from the dirt, hoping for a miracle, the sound of that gun isn't just noise. It is the sound of freedom. It is the sound of survival. Long live the warthog.